everyone, and welcome back to Don't Open That Door. I am Justin, the bodyguard. I'm Nico, your fun white friend. And I'm Dan, the DJ. And we are here today to discuss Bones. No, not the show you're probably thinking of, but the 2001 horror movie. Directed by Ernest Dickerson, we've got Snoop Dogg as Jimmy Bones, Pam Greer as Pearl, Bianca Lawson as Cynthia, Sean Armstrong as Maurice, and Khalil Kane as Patrick. So this story begins with a young man named Patrick, his brother and his sister, as well as their friend Maurice. The group purchase a massive house in, well, what you could describe as a less than affluent area, with the intention of turning it into a club. However, while exploring the dilapidated house, Patrick's sister comes across a ravenous black dog that just wants to keep eating and eating. Now, despite the neighbors and people in the street literally telling them, this shit is haunted and cursed, leave the dog alone, the group decide, eh, what could happen? And they take the dog home. So what does happen, Dan? So a little bit later, Patrick and his crew meet a psychic named Pearl and her daughter, Cynthia. Cynthia joins up with the crew, and in the house, they discover the body of Jimmy Bones, who is a former that guy and just the general protector of the neighborhood and just the He's just that dude. dude. He's just that dude. Yeah. So they don't really tell anybody that they found the body because they fear that it will ruin their chances of opening a club up in this house. So Patrick shows his father the house a little bit later, and his father starts to really freak out and tells him that he needs to sell the house. We don't really know why, but not too long after that, Pearl also confesses to Cynthia, her daughter, that Jimmy Bones is actually Cynthia's father. All right. And so, Nico, we've heard a little bit about Jimmy Bones, but who, who actually was he? So it turns out that we're taking a way back time machine moment here. A flashback, if you will. That was not one of my better moments. It turns out that back in the 70s, Patrick's father, Jeremiah, was Jimmy Bones' right-hand man. Shock and awe. When Jeremiah tried to help introduce crack into the neighborhood, Jimmy Bones refused. He's just a stand-up dude. And as a result, the new dealers kill Jimmy Bones and make Jeremiah Bones' bodyguard. And lover Pearl, yes, that one, complicit. Mm, so now we find out that Jimmy Bones got betrayed. So how does it develop from there, Dan? So now we're kind of back into, in our synopsis, we're back here into modern day. And Patrick and his crew end up opening the club in this spot that used to be Jimmy Bones's. Now, at first, things are going really well, but then the ravenous dog ends up turning into a woman and lures the friend Maurice upstairs with promises of getting it in. So once they get upstairs, the dog turns into Snoop Dogg and, or Jimmy Bones, and <laughs> uh, the Jimmy Bones dog, I should say, and he ends up eating Maurice. As he eats Maurice, the blood and skin and whatever kind of goes, transfers to Jimmy Bones' body, the, the skeleton of Jimmy Bones, and it resurrects him. So now Jimmy makes it rain maggots on everyone all over in, in the club and the, the party goers and everything. And it was actually kind of gross. Yes. So all the party goers run outside. Jimmy begins to enact his revenge, finding the corrupt cop, drug dealer, and bodyguard that helped kill him, and he in turn kills them. So he kidnaps Jeremiah, the, the father of the, the main characters, and Patrick, Cynthia, and Pearl go back to the house to try to rescue Jeremiah. So Pearl indicates that it is her old dress that is stained with Bones' blood, that allows his spirit to continue to exist in this world. So they go to look for it to hopefully try to destroy it or something so that Bones will get killed. Well, how does that work out for them, Nico? So Bones basically pushes Jeremiah into hell through a bunch of, like, clay people. Okay. And then he attacks Patrick. It continues further. Pearl realizes that she's wearing the dress that Bones put it on her with some type of magic somehow and she just goes ahead and uh does the immediate rational thing and lights herself on fire killing herself and bones so then patrick and cynthia make it out of the house but it's revealed that since cynthia has bones as blood he is now possessing her oof the movie ends with cynthia vomiting maggots like you do what a close 
So now let's go ahead and break it down to the technical bits, shall we? Let's lead off with, I mean, it's, it, Snoop Dogg is in the movie. He's pretty much the star of the show. So what's the audio like, Dan? I mean, what is it like? Musically, we get a bunch of hip hop, kind of as, mm-hmm. as you would expect from, from this movie. From the technical audio side of things, the audio wasn't all that great. There's a lot of times there it's very clearly overdubbed. There's times where the overdubbed audio does not come anywhere close to matching with what's going on on the scene. There's one part near the beginning where these two cops, uh, one of them I think is the corrupt cop, is like saying something. I can't remember what he says. He's like, don't go in that house or something. But in the scene, you actually see him shove a sub in his mouth. A hoagie in his mouth. So there's no <laughs> yeah. way that he can even be talking. But hey, he's, man, over he's here just a talking. mad good ventriloquist. <laughs> Apparently. So there's times like that kind of scattered throughout the movie. So on a technical level, the audio really isn't that good. But I mean it it kind of works. Okay. I did want to add one more thing. So you you were right about the technical stuff, but in terms of the score, I just want to say this movie has one of the coolest lineups in the soundtrack I've ever seen. So you've obviously got Snoop Dogg, but you've got MC Ren, you've got Corrupt, Exhibits, Superfly, Cypress Hill, and Outcast, as well as Nate Dogg, RIP. But D12. Yeah, D12's there too. It's it's crazy, yo. They have a lot, a lot of talent on this soundtrack. And I do appreciate the the little snippets that we do get to hear throughout the movie. It's I like I really, really good. appreciate it. Yeah. So in terms of visuals now, I'm going to go ahead and turn the page to you, Nico. What do, what do you think about the visuals? I have mixed feelings about the visuals. Okay. I think this is a movie from 2001, and I mean that in it a is. good way and in, well, just the way that it is. It has a certain, like, it looks as if it was shot through an, an MTV filter. The The color grading is very bright way. I don't know how to describe it. It looks like fruit, almost. And uh, there there were a lot of Dutch angles in this that I didn't really fuck with that much. But in terms of just the, the character design and the, the setting, I think it's actually coherently done. And we get a lot of atmosphere from that house. They definitely got their money's worth from having that as the setting. Agreed. Now, it's interesting, Nico, that you talk about, you know, good and bad, because I kind of feel the same way about the special effects. So the special (laughs) effects that I didn't like was sometimes they would like interpose Snoop's face onto a dog. (laughs) That was the fucking best part of the film. You shut your whore mouth. Literally just like it was. (laughs) Don't you fucking dare say that was bad. No, I mean, okay, okay, okay. So they put his face on the dog and it just looks like what was this? Snoop Dogg became the dog. No, listen, in the music video, (laughs) oh gosh, um, what is it? It's not gin and juice, is it? It might be, no. He what doesn't is it? turn into a fucking dog in Jim and Jim, I tell you that. No, 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 no. Dan, know. what Snoop Dogg music video is it where members of his crew and stuff, they all turn into dogs? Um, God, fuck, why does it escape me? I know it. I haven't it. seen very oh. many of his videos. I mean, no, I, yeah, I yeah, know yeah. this, the track too. I know what you're talking about, but it's not coming to me either. But Yeah, well, the <laughs> point is the special, effects, the special effects in that music video were better than the special <laughs> effects in this in this um in this movie <laughs> particularly wrong. particularly when they talk about the face being on the dog or sometimes they put like what looks to be a projector screen and cast Snoop onto the walls or something mm. <laughs> i thought that was i had mixed feelings about that but then holy shit sometimes this movie blew me the yes. fuck away the people yeah. on the like, wall, like that, yes. that stuff was crazy good. Yes. The fucking billiards table. Yes. The bed scene. It was so like, yes. how is there? How is it the same movie that has that crazy good blood effects with the bed scene there that I almost thought was kind of maybe like an homage to Nightmare? Possibly. Well, why don't you why don't you discuss what happens in that bed scene real quick, Nico, for the listeners? Okay, so it's like a pool of blood that she is simultaneously is she? sleeping. Um, uh, Pearl, right? Cynthia. 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 Okay, I couldn't remember if it was her or the other, but anyway, the Cynthia is in, and she it is 
it looks like she's just sleeping at first, but then it gets redder and redder and deeper and deeper, and it looks like she's actually swimming in a pool of blood, and it just, it, it coalesces into this really disturbing looking scene like something you would see out of a Kubrick film so another thing that I thought was really cool about that because that was a very big piece of foreshadowing to show that she is his blood yeah but that Your like boy loves some symbolism you don't even like you don't even know you really don't even know until it happens but I mean Dan Nico and I have kind of waxed on about the visuals you got anything else to add I mean that's mostly it I, I mean kind of like you guys I was gonna say like there's some effects that are really not good and then some like really good effects. So that was just really interesting to me. It's like there's a few things that they kind of obviously put their budget into. And then right. the other ones, they were just kind of like, hey, well, we well, got to make do. I, I kind of like the audio. I, I kind of think it worked all in all. True. So I guess kind of in this vein, does this movie hold up? Not just in terms of visuals and audio, but in terms of the movie itself. Do you think... Not to get too far ahead of ourselves here, but do you think this is something that does hold up? Like somebody could watch it today for the first time, maybe, and enjoy it just as much as a movie that was released in, you know, the last decade? I think so. This came out in 2001. Okay. Why do you think um, that? I mean, yeah, there's definitely technical issues and we're way farther advanced in, in that aspect. Mm -hmm. But for me, when I started watching it the first like 10 or 15 minutes, I was kind of like, oh man, this, this isn't great. But then once I got into it, I I thought it was pretty good. And it's like something clicks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 again, like even some of those like technical, you know, visual effect kind of scenes are really good. And like I actually was like, wow, that's really good. Like even by today's standard, maybe yeah, not quite yeah. like you know, like huge budget Marvel movie good, but still like I was quite impressed. I also think it's a fairly like classic story. Yes. Yes, it is. You know, sort of revenge. You know, somebody wrongly killed, getting revenge, coming back to haunt, that kind of thing. It's a pretty classic story. So it's, you know, that seems familiar. So, so I, you know, I didn't have any problems digesting that part or anything. So I, I, I do think it holds up. Yeah, I concur. But Nico, you agree as well? I do, but for different reasons. This movie is so fucking fun. It's a mess, mm -hmm. but it's so fucking fun. And I really thoroughly enjoyed this. I enjoyed this more than some of the movies that I think are arguably considered classics in our time so far. And I don't think enough horror movies really do have an aspect of just fun oftentimes i mean say I think, say what you mean say say you like this more than child's play just say it yeah i can't fucking stand child's play this is so much better jesus christ so now that we're kind of in agreement about the good i guess not the goodness but how good this movie actually is let's let's kind of talk about our you know the title character here jimmy bones we already said he's the protector of the neighborhood and we also kind of see that he's betrayed backstabbed then literally front stabbed <laughs> and he pretty much, you know, he comes back for revenge. Is Jimmy Bones a bad guy? No, I don't think he is. I mean, he mostly just kills the people that wronged him or that, <laughs> that he feel, you know, wronged him. Right. That's about it. And when he, back when he was alive, like he was a good dude. I, I think they said he like ran lottery tickets or something. Right. So he wasn't even like a bad gangster kind of thing. Like, I guess he was sort of a gangster kind of maybe, but he was like an aggressive Mr. Rogers <laughs> or not even aggressive, just like a commanding Joe. Mr. Rogers. Yeah. And I mean, there's scenes where like he's walking down the street and like everybody loves him and, and he was against having crack in his neighborhood and, you know, he was, like he's he was a, good dude. a good dude. Yeah, he was that guy. I think all that is true. I also think that he he gave just rewards to the people who, you know, so the dirty cop and the drug dealer, Eddie Mac, who betrayed him, like not even betrayed him, like they just straight up double crossed him and they forced him to like do these things. He chopped off their heads, straight yeah. up chopped off their heads. But his friend, Jeremiah, he he didn't kill him at first. He was like, What's up, Jeremiah? He, he still refers to him as, you know, like my brother. It's more than just, you know, like a slang term or anything. Like, I feel like he really still, like, he still cares for There's him. He's like, kinship. I just gotta, 
Yeah, he's like, I, I just got to do this because you did betray me, dog. And he was like, what, well, what do you want me to do? He's like, you could have died with me, man. Interesting. Like, I almost take it the opposite, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah, because the the two drug dealers, the cop and the, the, the drug dealer, that was just like almost a business transaction gone wrong. Almost like he didn't know those guys before then. Right. But Jeremiah, like he knew he was close to. And Jimmy Bones even says you were always trying to better your situation with interest. He says like the other two guys were trying to better their situation, but you, you're trying to get better and then some, and you mm -hmm. did whatever you could to look out for yourself and fuck everyone else. You just wanted your own shit. And we kind of see that in Jeremiah's current character. Like the family's like having dinner at one point and, and Jeremiah's like, yeah, I have a Lexus and look at all this good shit I have. And he's like super proud of all the, the big shit that he's got. So I, I almost think it's like Jimmy Bones feels more betrayed by him because he knew him and it was more malevolent versus the two, the two drug dealers who were just trying to get their drugs into the city. See, I agree with that, but I also feel that despite that kind of revenge that he feels like he has to take, because he does feel wronged, I still don't think he hates him, though. I don't, I think he's still like, and it's like, it's, it's kind of a weird feeling. I don't really know how to describe it when like, you got to take revenge on a motherfucker, but at the same time, that's still your people's in a way, kind yeah, of. But he also tortures them. He plays with them. Yeah. He does, because I think he wants him to understand that like, the torture for, for him was seeing the people he expected to have his back because he literally is on the floor begging him when they stab him to death. Mm. He's on the floor begging him, please, please help me, man, help me. And like the dude is just like, nah, I'm not about to take, take a hit for you. So Nico, you kind of said you didn't really think he was a bad guy. I absolutely, I think he's actually a hero, like straight up, like kind of like an anti-hero, I guess. He's like the Punisher because think about it. The only people who, the worst thing he did was give some people some extra protein with the maggots. That's it like and the rest know, of it blow up the whole house with people in it no but everyone got out okay yeah so he still blew up the house whatever a pro said if he wanted you dead you'd be dead he's just trying oh, to flex true. yeah so, okay imagine blowing up a house to flex on a motherfucker though well, like it was his house i i know but like he had the fucking gall to do that jimmy bones is just that dude he is that guy. As Jimmy we have Bones confirmed. is that dude. But as I do have, have a theory confirmed. I would like to depo deposit. Am oh, I, no. I, I mean, posit. Okay. Anyway, um, I think, and this is a stretch, but I think we could view the conflict between Jimmy Bones and Maurice as an extension of the sort of a lot of rhetoric, or, and maybe not rhetoric, but conversations that go on surrounding, you know, people moving out of the neighborhoods that they grow up in. The, the reason that I bring that up particular is because one of the, the books that I teach in my class is the hate you give and there is a um and dear martin too and in in particular in the hate you give we see this dynamic and this sort of relationship of setting being tied to you know who you are as a person and while this is a very 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 different film in terms of tone genre and everything from the hate you give I just wanted to acknowledge the at least greater symbolism of these characters as being something that most certainly director Ernest Dickerson was definitely cognizant of while making. Just wanted to say that's pretty fucking cool if that is intentional. Oh, it absolutely 10 trillion percent is. Yeah. But I believe you're referring to Jeremiah, not Maurice. Definitely meant that. Yep. So, I'm, you know, to kind of further the point, and that kind of takes us into the next kind of section almost where we're going to talk about maybe some of the tropes this movie had. One of them is definitely there are people who are basically sellouts. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah is a sellout. That's what he is. Cause they talk, the he, he has a conversation with Jimmy bones and you know, he's like, well, don't you ever want to leave? I want to just get the hell out of here. And Jimmy bones is like, nah, I'm good. I'm chilling. My people are happy. I want to see my people grow and prosper. Yeah. And that, you know, it definitely has its roots in, I mean, even if you, um, Jay-Z kind of talked about this when he dropped 444 or whatever. He talked about, you know, the power and value of investing in your own neighborhood. Yeah. And people oftentimes, whenever they do make it, especially when, you know, when you're coming out the hood or whatever, 
like people make it and then people just dip set, right? And it's not just in those types of areas, but just kind of a general concept. Like who owns the land where you live? Is it your people or is it people who live, you know, right. a ways away and they own it and you just, you reside there, but they really have control of it. So yeah. I do think it definitely, definitely took a look at that as well. I also obviously think they hinted at Maurice being a little bit of a pothead. They do. They say that like once mm -hmm. in the movie, but I mean, Dan, it's a Snoop Dogg movie, but it's not really, it's not what you would associate with Snoop Dogg, you know, all the weed and stuff like that. No. He doesn't really do that at all. No, not really. I mean, like Justin said, there's like one scene, I think, where where Maurice is about to light a blunt, I think, and then he gets killed before he can. The only drug usage in it is crack, but that's even like accidental. That was forced. Yeah, forced. Yeah. Not accidental. He never forced, actually, yeah. I don't think he actually takes drugs in this. No. Does he? I don't think no. so. Huh. I mean, he might like smoke a cigar or something, but. And even though he's not, as well as not just doing it, like seeing him do it, it's also not a very like trippy movie. It's not like yeah. a mm -hmm. kind of stoner movie or anything like that either. So mm -hmm. no, not, not really. All. all right. And I feel like it's also important to talk about, because I feel like when you look at the setting of the movie, Snoop Dogg's in the movie, you know, we have a literal, aside from, I think, two characters there are two white characters everyone else is a minority so there's obviously some stereotypes that people would assume about the movie but they actually flip a bunch of them on their heads i mean right nico i know we just mentioned it but i i gotta say i really genuinely was surprised and impressed at the, the just the depth that snoop had here and how much he fit into the, the fabric of the movie like i genuinely can't imagine there being another person to play that character other than snoop dogg like i really cannot imagine anyone else as jimmy bones and i don't think that happens a lot when you have celebrities who are guest starring or something outside of their medium of choice like if you got i don't know just like a different rapper on there or something and, and i just i really do think that that is just super significant so there's actually there's actually one or two people who I believe could potentially have done it. But we'll talk about that next section because it ties into something completely different. But I think one stereotype that also is definitely something I'm super glad they kind of flipped or averted is Patrick. When you just visualize or you hear like, oh, he's trying to, you know, like start up like a hip hop club. His brother and his brother's, you know, best friend are they're, they're a DJ duo, you know? you might form this mental image of Patrick in your mind. But in reality, Patrick is super articulate. He's fucking, edu he's, I was gonna say educational. He's fucking intelligent. He's fucking <laughs> educational. No, he's, he's intelligent. He's fucking, I mean, he's business minded too because, and he believes in himself and he motivates mm -hmm. the people around That's him. That's true. They talk about and, that as a plot point too. Like how are we yeah. gonna maintain a fucking house by ourselves? Yeah. It's not like, dropped or anything they actually address that which i like and it's also really cool because one of the specific reasons why he wanted to go back is because he, he said this is where we're from this is the roots he tells his dad this you know like this is where you're from so i wanted to give something back like he specifically mentions it and that's kind of like this is a very positive way of thinking and so i thought that was really dope and i was very glad you know that they could have they well, i don't think they would have given you know who we have directing the movie but a lazier director, a lazier writer would have just made them all like drug dealers or something like that. We would have gotten a whole slew of stereotypes and right. that would have been it, cut and dry. Yeah. And I'm super glad they didn't. I'm really glad they didn't do that. But one thing they did do was they had a ton of references to other movies. So Dan, go ahead and lay some on me. Go ahead. I think one of my favorite references is just with Jimmy Bones being a skeleton at first and then when the dog eats people and, and consumes flesh the skeleton gets the flesh and bone or flesh and skin and flesh and, skin. Flesh and bones. Uh, blood and everything goes to the, the skeleton until he comes alive. And that's very much a direct reference to a uh, Hellraiser with Frank mm -hmm. um, slowly coming back to life, like just like the exact same way. Right. So I also think, and this is well noted if you ever see the movie or, you know, read up on it, they say that it references, you know, like old uh, black exploitation films and they definitely do. And I mean, in the flashback to the 70s, I dig the atmosphere. 
you know, the how they talk, the atmosphere, everything they have going on. The it is kind of like watching. Really cool. mm-hmm. Yeah, it is kind of like watching one of those old movies. And it's funny. So if you say, you know, who could have played Jimmy Bones? I think someone in so Sam Jackson, right? He well, no, listen. <laughs> okay. 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 So he has acted in a fuck ton of movies, like a fuck ton of movies. Right. And I'm trying to see one in particular. Um, what is it? I feel like Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith. Is yes. that it? Shut up. Yes. That's the one. No, it's sand. So yeah, that's what I thought. So in the year 2000, he acted as Shaft. He has that. He would have been a different son of a bitch. He did. He would have been a he? different kind of God. character. He, I mean, because you know, obviously Shaft is different from Jimmy Bones. But I feel like if he, if they had, if they had slotted him into the role and said, "Hey, this is who you got to be," I feel like he had the chops to pull it off. Oh, certainly. Yeah. I just mean like Snoop's charisma yeah. is just infectious. I Agreed. Think. Yeah, he, he right. I think Samuel L. Jackson could do it, but it would have been a very different Jimmy Bones. Yes. Yeah. Because um, Snoop has that just like really chill, nonchalant, just Smooth like. Smooth motherfucker yeah. Yeah. quality. And that's, exactly. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing. Like he was, he was mad chill. And we'll talk about one other thing here, but I did want to call out one more movie reference. It kind of sort of felt like when there was the people in the wall, that that really felt like Nightmare on Elm Street to me. Yeah, right? Mm-hmm. Fucking love that shit. So that was that was pretty badass as well as the uh as well as the the bed type deal. So and the billiards table where he cuts into yeah. it and just like a ton of blood spews yep. out. Yeah, that was, was very nightmare as well. Great that was scene. pretty fucking badass too by the way. Just have to put that up. Yeah. Like, the cinematography in this movie is fucking all over the place. Sometimes you'll have shots like that where everything it lines up great and you have this just wonderful moment of cinema. And then other times it looks like you are watching the movie through a purple tie-dye shirt that you made in your front yard. I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I liked it, though. I liked it overall. So. Oh, no, I, I, I really like it, too. I'm just saying. So let me go ahead and raise up an example here for a what would you do, right? So let's say, you know. Uh, Nico, that Dan and I want to go into the music industry. So we, you know, we kind of rent out a house where we can, you know, Dan can DJ because he's the DJ. And, you know, I can, I can spit a couple bars, maybe do some security work and you're just there too, chilling. So we, we rent out a house. (laughs) Not doing anything musical. I'm just there. there. You're there for the sound and whatnot. And, you know, we go into the house. I'm like, Hey guys, I got this as a great deal. We walk into the house, walk back out, and everyone's like, leave. This shit is haunted. Would you immediately leave? Um, If the entire community was? Yeah. I, I think I would. So you just did. I don't know if I would immediately leave. I would definitely be like, yo, why is this haunted? What's up? Oh, yeah. I would definitely probe. Like, I would probe, yeah, and then probably leave. So, and this is kind of, you know... Let's say, for example, though, you know, Nico is like, yeah, I'm not afraid of no ghost. So we're just, you know, posted up still. And it's the night of the concert. You know, I, whoever can be with whoever, who gets the girl, gets the girl or whatever. And so we're throwing a bump in concert. Everything's lit. And Snoop Dogg comes up. Not like Snoop Dogg, but Jimmy Bones. So and like maggots start raining everywhere. You would leave at that point in time, right? Well, oh, most yes. certainly. Now here's the question. No, motherfucker, what? Are you kidding me? So here's the question. It turns out that somehow in some twisted way, Nico disrespected Jimmy Bones and like kicked his skull or something like that. So Jimmy Bones kidnaps Nico. Dan, would you come with me to rescue Nico against Jimmy Bones? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> After is it the Snoop silence Dogg, really Bones, helped. Or Samuel L. Jackson, Jimmy Bones. I wouldn't fuck with Samuel L. Jackson, Jimmy Bones. Ooh, if that was a real okay, thing. Okay, yeah, no, that's crucial. If that was a real thing, nah. I'm out. I'm I'd be like, out. yo, I understand. I, I'm not even like, upset. I get it. Get out of my house, motherfucker. Yep. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, sorry, Mr. Jackson, sir. Like, nah, that would that would never happen. Also, he's a tall motherfucker. Snoop Dogg? He's mm-hmm. as tall as we are. Yeah. Me excluded. Like, I'm pretty sure he's taller than... He might be 6'4", he might be taller than me. Is he 6'3"? How the fuck am I about to know that? <laughs> You're supposed to know these things. Come on, how tall... What the fuck do we even do this right, podcast how for, Justin? Tall I'm so is fucking Snoop disappointed Dogg. How do you not know how tall Snoop Dogg is? Come right, on. Snoop Dogg is supposedly 6'4". Six, 6'4". Four. Six, four. Okay, yeah. yeah. We're the same height. 
I can look this motherfucker in the eye and give him the predator handshake and it'll be great. He also Snoop Dogg, please come on our podcast. He also is a size 12 shoe, so we share the same shoe size. Wow. Damn. So are you saying that Justin, your and I's fusion ha would be Snoop Dogg? I guess. I don't know. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's totally how that works. Same height and same shoe size. That's all you need. That's all you need. <laughs> Nothing else matters. We're totally going to end up with a fucking full metal alchemist situation on our hands. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, we might. And here's a question. Would you be afraid of Jimmy Bones if Jimmy Bones showed up but you didn't do him anything wrong? Yeah. Nah. There are two kinds of people. Okay, what version of Jimmy Bone? I'm talking like the undead version that came back. Okay, to be fair, he doesn't look that different. Yo, real quick, talk about looks. This man came out here looking like the fucking Undertaker. Like, straight up, he looks like the Undertaker, dude. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the only reason they had him blow up the house was just to get that scene where he's like blows up the house and he's walking up the steps with the like fire behind him and everything. Cool guy glasses <laughs> yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah. All I need is CSI Miami going, yeah! Man, I don't even know. Get the who going and... So... Wait, you don't know that reference? What? Fuck what? out of here. You don't know the fucking CSI Miami shit? I mean, of shit? course I do. Okay, okay I, I apologize for my hostility. I don't even I'm know. Sorry. I don't even know I'm about the, the blowing up the house. I'm sorry. I'm saying I'm sorry, damn! Well, okay, speaking of sorry, let's talk about these critic reviews. <laughs> So, yeah, man, uh, they got it a 23 on Rotten Tomatoes from the critics, Ouch. a 40% from the audience. Ugh. Ouch. See, I can understand the critic score Fuck because them. while I don't agree with that, Fuck them. If, if on a technical level, yeah, this movie wasn't that great. And I feel like that's mostly what critics look at. I mean, a, a good critic should be able to take that into account, but look beyond that as well. But I, I I can understand how it got that low on the critic side. The audience should be higher, though, I feel like. Definitely agreed. All right, so let's go ahead now. Well, first off, go ahead and speak your piece on the movie. You know, tell me, well, what did you think about it? Just generally, you know, brief. And then hit me with your score. We're going to go ahead and lead off with you, Dan. Because you're the man. Uh, so like I, thanks. Like I kind of was talking about, like, it's it's all over the place in audio and visual on the technical side of thing the acting a lot of times isn't all that great there's there's a lot of not great stuff but this is one of those movies that if you're not super critical on that it's just a good movie mm -hmm. like it's as I, I think we kind of talked about a lot like there's some really cool shit in it there's it's fun there's some really funny moments there's some like one-liners in here that are just hilarious. It's just a really good movie, and I really enjoyed watching it. I'm gonna give it an 80. Oof! Wow! Oof! Oof! oof. All right, Nico, what are your thoughts? <sighs> we mention this every now and then. How you know, doing the podcast, we often our views will change over the course of it, and I've just grown to like this more and more over the course of this session. This is a really surprisingly intelligent film for what it is as much of just a visual and aural grab bag that it is sometimes it's a mess sometimes it's great sometimes it is profound sometimes it's just what the fuck i'm gonna give it a 75 mm, interesting so i think i agree with what a lot a lot of what you said dan i think that so first off, I don't really have as quite as many technical problems as the two of you, I think. But nevertheless, I think it's a movie that just walk in with an open mind. Like, you know, let yourself have some fun. You'll have some fun. I do think that the first maybe 15-ish or so minutes might turn off some viewers because it, it does take just a little bit to get into its stride. But, I mean, once you're there, you're there. You're actively rooting for, for Jimmy Bones, you know? So I would give this... Or you fucking should be if you're not a monster. Yeah. So I would... <laughs> I know the visual language of film, like, kind of suggests that he's the villain, particularly with the, the fucking movie poster and all that, where, you know, he's got Snoop's eyes, he's looking like a fucking devil, and just how people keep, you know, talking about how scary and shit he is, but... If you look at this movie the way that I'm sure Ernest Dickerson wants us to look at the movie, you will see that dude is just 
a really good guy. And I like that he fucks with your expectations there. Yeah, I will say so based on that, I would I would assign it something around a 78 because I think that it's it's big fun. I enjoy it. I really do enjoy it. And I cannot help but think that a lot of people walked into this review and looking at it with a bias, like headspace. I honestly do think that because literally, you know, even on the Rotten Tomatoes, you know, like slow to the start, the sleek looking bones is more silly than scary. And then they gave it, you know, like a 20, it's got like a 23% on Rotten Tomatoes, you know, the rating. I get it's an aggregator, go fuck yourself. But at the same time, I just feel like this movie's unfairly picked on. It's not that fucking bad. It is nowhere near a fucking 23. Like, no. Like, go yoke your scrot if that's what you think, bro. Because <laughs> come again? What? What? You heard me. We're we're no, we're we're not moving forward until we address this. What the f- yoke your scrot? I kind of don't want to know more. I I don't know if I can continue this podcast without knowing more. Oh, well, you'll never know. So <laughs> let's go ahead now and let's really, you know, let, let, let's go ahead and put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. Is this a movie that you would recommend to a friend? I say yes. Dan? Yes. Nico? Yeah. Awesome. And as a separate note, does this movie get the golden seal of approval from you? I don't think I can do that. I can't, but... I also can't. But, and I'm I'm bringing this up, this would be the second time I've ever brought this up, I would say this movie is a diamond in the rough. But... I agree. But Nico agrees... But does Dan agree? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. agree. Okay, hang on. Okay, confirmed. (laughs) Oh, oh, shit, he got the filing cabinet out. That's the diamond in the rough sound. You know this episode is real. Were you you yoking your scroll? No, that's not what that sounds like. (laughs) No, no. That's not what that sounds like. So. Uh, Wait, so it has a distinct sound? We have lost. Now? We have lost. I'm not moving past this. So, yeah, you heard it. You heard it first. This is something we would recommend, and while it's not quite up to the standard of a golden seal of approval, it's definitely a diamond in the rough. I think it's well worth checking out if you're into horror movies, if you like Snoop Dogg, and you know, you get a little bonus if you like hip-hop and you like horror movies just like us. Well, if you enjoyed what you heard, please go ahead and give us a follow. We're on Twitter and Instagram at D-O-T-D Horror. We're on Facebook. Don't open that door. So yeah, if you haven't seen this movie, check it out. Why not? Why not? As always, you know, keep yourself safe. Be good to one another, and please, dear listener, don't open that door. Bye.